morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Sanusi. Um, I'm a pediatrician. I've been a physician for 30 years only. And I have a practice in Nigeria called Pediatric Partners Hospital. Um, I also work here in Atlanta. I'm actually here in Atlanta right now. And um, I have basically two worlds. So I practice here in Atlanta and in Nigeria. When the Wuhan virus started in November, we actually had patients coming in to ask us, hey, are we seeing this uh, coronavirus because they've heard that it's, it's spreading? And we were like, no, everything is fine. So far, so good. But in March, everything changed. Now, because they closed down schools, most children are at home. So unless they are very sick, they don't come into the hospital. So just the fact that they're not in school and schools are closed, from March, that actually, the numbers just went, just nosedived. And then with the fear of the pandemic, most children, when they get sick, if they're very, very sick, they go to the hospital. So they call their pediatrician. Most pediatricians, what they were doing was, oh, we don't want, if your child has a fever, go to the urgent care. So they would come to the urgent care. We would actually screen them from the car. So if they had fevers, we would screen them from the car. And if they sounded like they were exposed to COVID-19, because initially nobody was sure of what was going on. We weren't sure even about testing. The urgent cares weren't tested. Now we are. But in March, and when everything started, people would come in and want a test for their children. And we would tell them, okay, we had to call the uh, Center for Disease Control, and we had to call the infectious diseases specialist to find out what we needed to do, because it was almost like on a daily basis we were getting updated on coronavirus infections. Nigeria saw its first uh, coronavirus case in March, and this was when an Italian guy came into the country. Now, the history that Nigeria has of contact tracing is excellent because the healthcare, Nigeria is not a, a place where you have ventilators and intensive care and all the medical stuff that people have in developed countries. Um, so it's important, it was important, the, the health commissioner in Lagos, where our practice is located, and the healthcare systems in every state in Nigeria recognize the need for very uh, important isolation of positive patients. And they did a good job of spreading the numbers on social media. They had adverts everywhere. A lot of Nigerians are on Facebook. They had Facebook uh, numbers. Hey, call this number if you think you might have coronavirus or you've been exposed. And once you call the um, Lagos State government and say i've been exposed or i think i might have coronavirus they tell you what to do that number there's a, there's so many numbers that links you to that uh, to the infectious disease hospital and because of that a lot of times you know they're able to say okay we're going to quarantine your whole family and there are a lot of foot soldiers that would come to your house and say hey um, where's your wife where are all the people in the house and they'll monitor you very closely for two weeks and they'll come back and test you. Many times they would actually come to your house and do the test. So because of that, um, yes, we're testing more, but the numbers are still going up and people are actually, um, uh, we're seeing an increase in the numbers, but a lot of people are not dying like in other parts of the world. And we don't know why. Initially it was thought because the virus was uh, killed by heat but most of the people that are going into the infectious disease hospital, even without ventilators, they are all surviving and coming out. So it's, it's one of those things that over time we'll know exactly why. The thing about reopening the, uh, the economy and reopening uh, the different um, industries, like if you see what New York did when they had the peak, when they were at the peak of the coronavirus infection, I mean, they were recording tens of thousands of people getting infected every day. They had to shut everything down. Now, they gave time for the reopening. And I think that's the best thing that they could have done. Because New York, with all the people and the crowds so close to each other, you're going on the train, everybody's breathing over each other. There was no way they could have reopened so fast. Now, the rest of the country is not as populated as New York. I used to live in New York, so I, I can just imagine how it, how it would be or if it would have been if they had just reopened it so quickly. Now, we have to take examples from other countries instead of reinventing the wheel. Wuhan, China, they were closed for at least almost three months. 
after they had their their uh, spike in the numbers. Same thing with Italy. They closed down everything. They're just slowly reopening. Now, the thing with America, I think, first of all, Georgia was already opening. We had only been closed for about four weeks. By the 26th of April, everything started reopening. What that is telling people is that the leadership and the people that are reopening the, the economy, they've done their homework and it's safe to go out there and act like everything is fine just because they reopened the economy. They don't realize that a lot of people made that decision based on politics and based on money. Coronavirus is extremely infectious and everybody's wearing masks. When we used to go to work in the past, we would just go in and if a patient was infectious or had a bad cough, we would wear masks, just the regular surgical mask. Now everybody has N95 masks and we wear those every time we go into a, a patient's room to see a patient who has a fever. Now, if they come in for things like fractures or injuries and there's no history of fever, we wear the regular surgical mask. But once there's a history of fever, we wear the N95 masks, which are the special masks that prevent any kind of particle, particles from being inhaled. A lot of physicians are actually looking into telemedicine. Like, I do telemedicine, but I wear my coat and I do it at home. And um, when we go in, into the hospital and see patients, you know, it's basically physicians are just not doing as much work as we used to do. And that's really because of the numbers and the fear that COVID-19 has created in, in patients. There's a lot of research going on with uh, coronavirus and there's a big push for vaccines. Now, it's important to do um, to have vaccines for this. But the problem with vaccines, a lot of vaccines sometimes can have side effects, especially if they're not well tested or if animal studies have not been done. You don't want to take a vaccine that in another five or 10 years, you now realize that, oh, after I took that vaccine, something happened to me. I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. You know, safe vaccines are important. I think research is important in that area. But even just having adequate tests, in my practice here in Atlanta, it's taking 10 days to get the results for coronavirus testing. How about, you know, like strep tests, you go into a place, they have rapid strep, you know if you have strep or not, that determines if you go to work or not for the next 24, 48 hours. How about developing tests that are available to everybody that comes out in two minutes and that you know is accurate? Because sometimes you go do this test, one minute you are negative, next minute you are positive, then another, in a, especially in Nigeria, we had uh, the Lagos State government come and test all our staff because we had one case of coronavirus, a patient who was positive. The one minute the test was negative. Then later on, they call back, oh, we're not sure this is 10 days. The test might be inconclusive. So the problem is testing. If you put in the research to get adequate tests that are accessible, free, and that the results come out within two, three minutes, and you know your test is accurate, that would be half of the problem solved because if I'm positive for COVID and I can test and know that, okay, I'm positive, I can quarantine and know that, okay, if I get worse, I go to the hospital versus, okay, I'm, I have symptoms and I've tested myself, but I don't know for 10 days whether it's positive or not, whether I'm positive or not. That's the main problem. So if you do not know what you're dealing with, how will you know how to solve it? The, the hardest populations are the little kids it's kind of hard if you have a kindergarten or a kindergartner to say, hey, no, you can't sit with your friend. They all want to hug themselves and walk together and be friends. And in general, it's kind of hard to have them wear masks, especially for prolonged periods of time, because the mask, even when we wear it at work, those masks can get very claustrophobic. And the face shields might actually be a better, um, it might actually be a better choice for the younger kids because they might look at it and think that, oh yeah, I look like the, those uh, superheroes with my face shield. And the face shield, it protects the mucous membranes of the eyes and the nose and even the mouth, but um, it's not as effective as wearing a mask. But something is better than nothing. I would recommend face shields for children if they can keep it on and frequent hand washing. And if the children are sick, you know, the, the, a lot of places are checking temperatures. If the children are sick, you know, it's important to educate parents that 
um, to let them know that, you know, if your child has a fever, please go check, go have them checked with the doctor. And that's the, the main thing that we're saying, you know, educating the parents so that they can quickly have the children checked out. Um, in general, coronavirus is not a terrible illness in children. We do have uh, what is called MCIS, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which we usually see in children who have been infected with the coronavirus and they come, they come up with it in about six weeks. It's kind of like an inflammation of the different systems of the body. So if there's a, a, an illness called Kawasaki, Kawasaki is an illness that just causes inflammation all over the body and children present with rashes, um, kidney failure, multi-system organ failure. We're seeing that with coronavirus, but in general, it's not the typical, it's not the commonest presentation. A lot of children still have the respiratory illness. They can have the uh, uh, shortness of breath. They need oxygen and decreased uh, appetite. They need IV fluids just to flush the virus out and they get better. But it's not, the, the illness is not as lethal in children as it is in adults. But I, it's just a very tough time and it's an unprecedented time. And I think we just have to play by ear and go one, one day at a time. But with the reopening of schools, especially with the young children, kindergartners, first graders, by the time they're like seven, eight, nine, you can even put a measure of social distance in there. But when they're so little, especially in the preschools, you know, the uh, nursery schools, it's very hard. If it was possible, I would recommend that as much as possible, people stay home unless you are an essential worker. Because the government is saying we're reopening the economy doesn't mean it's safe to reopen. Unless you're an essential worker and you have PPE from your place of work, then stay home. I think it's important that people just bear in mind that, you know, we're still in a pandemic. Wear your mask because that, if the people that were taking care of patients in China and washing their hands and wearing their masks didn't get infected in that close proximity, then we'll be all right. We just need to do the right thing. Stay home as much as possible. Wash your hands, wear your mask when you go out and um, just practice social distancing. That's, that's, it's a no brainer. And it's simple, uh, but a lot of times, because it's so simple, people don't take it seriously.